Good afternoon. My name is Marty Leon. I am the anchor person for this event. We want to welcome you in this early lunchtime symposium. Uh, the meeting is entitled uh, Integrating FFR Angio into Your Daily Practice, Empowering Wire-Free Insights. It is sponsored by a combination of Medtronic and CathWorks. I am thrilled to mention that our spokesperson, who has just arrived exactly on time, <laughs> is the iconic Bernard De Bruyne. <laughs> and let me introduce the rest of our discussants, speakers, Ajay Kirtane uh, from uh, New York City, Columbia University, Gianluca Campo, who's a real expert at understanding FFR and, and uh, um, angio-based FFR, Ran Karnowski, uh, who is one of the leading interventionalists in Israel and is one of the pioneers in this technology, and Jonathan Hill, who's one of the uh, brilliant uh, interventionalists in London and who has applied both intravascular imaging and physiology to his daily practice in creative ways. So we want this to be both a practical but also an exciting conference for you. Um, this technology, Angio FFR, is not commercially available in Europe as yet, but will become so. Uh, in the foreseeable future. It has been in development for several years. I have spent several decades trying to understand how we can better improve PCI with more scientific principles for decision making. Unfortunately, I think I failed miserably, even though we were early adopters of intravascular imaging and physiology. And in a place like Columbia, 90% of our PCI cases are driven by science-based decisions from either uh, imaging and or physiology. That is not the case everywhere. And we tend to believe that there's too many burdens in the daily workflow to be able to use some of these principles. But in the modern era, with artificial intelligence and new technology, there may be opportunities to be able to uh, develop and empower the interventionalist with new information to help with decision making without the either cost or other burdens of some of the earlier technologies. And that's really what we're going to explore. We're going to talk about the role of intraprocedural image-based FFR. We're going to help you to understand how you might incorporate FFR angio-guided decisions to improve patient care. And we're going to do this with a series of case-based discussions on how it might apply in bifurcations and multivessel disease pre and post PCI. And then we're going to help you to integrate, at least conceptually, how to apply FFR angio into everyday clinical practice and be a little self-critical about some of the things we still need to learn, more evidence that needs to be accumulated, new studies that might be considered. So we think this is going to be an energized 45 minutes with this great group of speakers and discussants. And what I'd like to do is to introduce our first speaker, who is my very close friend and colleague, Ran Kornowski, who will talk about F, um, FFR Angio from concept to reality. So I would like to take you from the concept into the clinical reality of FFR Angio. And these are my conflict of interest. As was mentioned, I will, I'm the co-founder of CatWorks. CatWorks has developed a proprietary technology to assess physiologic impact of coronary artery stenosis based on angiograms aiming at replacing the invasive fractional flow reserve, the FFR diagnostic procedure. FFR is the diagnostic measure that evaluates the physiologic impact of coronary artery stenosis, making it an important part of the decision-making therapeutic process when managing patients with coronary artery disease in the CAT lab. The FFR angio system uses a computational algorithm and artificial intelligence software capabilities integrated with patient-specific hemodynamic data to obtain the FFR angio assessment. And following series of clinical trials and investigation, the FFR angio technology obtained FDA, CE, and Japanese regulatory approval for commercial clinical utilization. This is a short demo case you see on the upper panel, the circumflex with moderate stenosis with an FFR angio of 0 0.71 before revascularization and based on the assessment after revascularization, you see the FFR angio normalized to 0 0.98, very intuitive to the operator in terms of the visualization and the color-coded values of the FFR angio. 
So 10 years ago, we had this vision which became clinical reality to utilize existing cat lab imaging without wires and no drug simulation and to obtain a multi-vessel FFR analysis. And here we are at 2023. So the three uh, phases of FFR angio acquisition are based on the routine angiogram, uh, 2D transforming it to, into a 3D reconstruction, and then the algorithm supported by the AI with an FFR angio display. In the current talk, I would like to focus on FFR angiography pre precision and accuracy. This is the focus of my talk today. So we had the pivotal trial, the FFR, the FAST FFR, which was a multi-center international uh, study to compare the diagnostic accuracy of FFR angio compared to a pressure wire derived FFR. The trial included 301 patients, 319 lesions among 10 centers. And this was an independent and blinded comparative analysis with a wide spectrum and lesions included, as well as some exclusion criteria such as STEMI, SVGs, CTOs, TIMI frames less than two, and poor ejection fraction. The diagnostic performance was excellent in this study, sensitivity of 94%, specificity of 91%, diagnostic accuracy, or I would say diagnostic precision of 92%. One third of the lesions were in the gray zone of FFR between 0.75 to 0.85, which is a vulnerable uh, zone for FFR evaluation. So in this gray zone, the sensitivity was 89%, specificity of 85%, and diagnostic accuracy of 87%. In terms of the correlation coefficient, this was displayed here on the left, correlation coefficient of 0.8, and you see the blunt alpan uh, deviation, which was around 12% to other side, and the area other, uh, under the curve was 0.94. So very good precision in this fast FFR pivotal trial that was the basis for the FDA submission and approval. In a cumulative analysis performed by my colleague, Dr. Guy Wittberg, we studied uh, all together five studies, including the FAST FFR, and again, compared the FFR angio to the wire-based FFR among 588 patients, 700 lesions. We had a wide spectrum of lesions and patient and clinical scenario and well distributed among all coronary vessels in both stable and unstable patients, excluding STEMIs. And again, sensitivity was 91%, specificity was 94%, diagnostic accuracy 93%, positive predictive value of 91%, negative predictive value of 94%, and area under the curve of 95%. And again, you can see, very similar to what we saw in the FAST FFR, the uh, deviation analysis around 11, 12%. And again, in terms of the correlation coefficient in this uh, meta-analysis, it was 0.83. The area under the curve was 0.95, which means a very good correlation and very good accuracy and precision of these uh, techniques. We have series of peer review publication in the best medical journals, and I think that we have robust data to support the precision of the FFR angio compared to the wire-based FFR. But this is not the end of the story. This is just the beginning, because the key question is, what is the clinical outcome in terms of using FFR angio in order to guide therapeutics of coronary artery disease patient in the catheterization laboratory. So we teamed up with the side, the first side that adopted this uh, uh, technology in Gifu, Japan. 
our center, Rabin Medical Center, and the team at Gifu, and we studied some f uh, almost 500 patients, and we checked the clinical outcome after one year among patients with deferred, no intervention, best medical treatment based on FFR angio versus patients that underwent PCI based on the cutoff of 0.8. So you see that the overall clinical outcome has been excellent up to one yield. The fair patient in red, 2.5% MACE rate versus 4.1% among patients who underwent PCI. And last ACC, we also presented the two years analysis from the same study. Deferred patient, 3.5% MACE rate versus 7.6% in patients that underwent PCI. And this was along the line of results of the most contemporary study. This is a study by Ku last in a year at the New England Journal of Medicine comparing FFR group versus IVUS group. You see that the MACE rate here is around 8, 8.5 percent. And you see on the right our analysis and our results based on the FFR angio um, guidance, whether patients were treated or not in the cat lab. And in the current URI PCR, earlier during the day, Dr. Guy Wittberg also, uh, 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 also uh, presented a very extensive investigation, actually the largest investigation so far, of some 1,500 patients, 2,200 lesions from six centers in Japan and our center in Israel. And patients were guided by the FFR angio. 547 patients underwent revascularization, and 88, uh, 888 patients had uh, deferred intervention and were kept on best medical treatment. You see here again striking finding up to one year, the deferred patient had only 1.6% of overall MACE rate, extremely low. The patient that underwent PCI had 6.8%, and again, very few events, most of the events were related to repeat revascularization. Again, confirming the ability to use the FFR angio in terms of predicting and guiding the patient outcome up to one to two years. And the uh, conclusions from this study were that in the real world setting, one year outcome of FFR, FFR angio, guided treatment were excellent and consistent with current data for wire-based FFR guided treatment. These results extend currently available data for FFR angio guided treatment, showing its clinical utility and potential to promote the use of physiologic assessment in everyday clinical practice. Now, I would like to spend a minute to talk about uh, the, I would say the inflammatory topic of this field, which is how to deal with discordant cases. So the intrinsic biologic complexity and variability of coronary physiology subject repeated measurements or comparative assessment into the possibility of discordant. The risk of reported discordant cases is between 10 and 15 percent and it's augmented in the gray zone of FFR, which is between 0.75 and 0.85. And this is true for every comparative analysis, even, by the way, with FFR versus FFR, IFR, IMR, PDPA, DPR, FFR angio, QFR, VFFR, CFR, etc. So this inevitably creates some discordance between technology and has been shown in several studies. So you're never going to get 100% coagulance between two techniques and even between one technique versus the same technique using repeated measurements. For the FFR angio, what I would advise that if you have discordant cases, the first thing that you need to do is to look at your angio, because in many cases you're going to see that there was a suboptimal angiogram that was not acquired according to the specification, whether it was insufficient vessel filling, more movement of the, of the table, or uh, some other hurdle associated with angiogram. So this is something to be explored. But 
there are some discordant cases. And it's very different whether we are talking about below or beyond the 0.8 cutoff, which needs to be dealt, and I'm going to address that, or there are some discordant within either the normal zone or the abnormal zone. So if we have a patient with, let's say, one technique 0.84 and the other 0.94, we don't like to see it, but it's not going to affect the clinical decision. But th what we do when we have a patient a little bit below or beyond 0 0.8, let's say it's 0 0.78 versus 0 0.82. So I would say that we should expand the medical judgment and apply a comprehensive coronary and clinical assessment beyond just the FFR or the FFR angio cutoff. The clinical scenario, pre-angio tests, angiographic findings, intracoronary Im imaging, physiology, all should be factored and should be taken into account. And we as clinicians should make a decision based on multiple parameters and factors, not just based on a single number, whenever we hesitate, let's say, in this 0 0.79 versus 0 0.81. This would be my advice. I would like also to emphasize that the technology integrates with every modern catheterization laboratory equipment. We are not restricted to one vendor. It's really like the Intel inside. It fits all the equipment. So what is the summary and take-home message? The FFR angio system provides an interactive 3D model of the coronary tree color-coded by FFR, calculating single and multi-vessel FFR in real time before and after PCI, and we can also perform very easy pullbacks of the full coronary tree, physiologic fullback of the full uh, coronary tree. The FFR angio system demonstrates excellent diagnostic performance compared to traditional FFR wires across a wide spectrum of patients and lesion subgroups. And the FFR angio guided treatment provides excellent one to two years outcome for PCI and deferred lesions, as I showed in the current talk and the FFR angio technology may become, or perhaps should become, a standard of care in diagnostic angiography and coronary intervention. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Ran, for this crystal clear presentation. So we have five, maybe a little bit more minutes for discussion. There are two microphones, one in the back, one in the front. Please don't be shy, introduce yourself. Oh, and this lady is going to run around with the microphone, that's even better. So, questions? Not yet. Well, while you are thinking of your questions, I, have, uh, I think your point about these uh, concordance, discordance was very, very well taken. And I think it is important to stress, and let's be very open, very fair, that with accumulating data, you will see that in daily life, the area under the curve will no longer be 0.95, but it will be in the range of 0.85, 0.80, 82, depending on the systems, depending on the centers. I think that even with these data that are published and even presented here during PCR, we have to realize the added value of these kind of techniques and in particular of the FFR angio. So, it is often presented as sobering results. No, it is not sobering at all. For me, it's extremely reassuring that the area under the curve of all these presentations is around 0.80. That's the first observation. Now, I see that there are no questions. I don't know if there are questions in the panel. Yes, John. So, yes, I mean, I'm blown away by the most recent data. The deferral data is, is stunning. But the question I have about the inter-cath lab variability, so to Ran, when, when all these centers have been using uh, this system, have you noticed any difference between any of, whether it's a Philips lab or a GE lab or what the settings are angiographically? Is there, is there, a, is there a minimum standard of cath lab that you have to have to, to deliver the right level of spatial resolution? I can tell you that we have both uh, in our center, uh, both Philips and Siemens lab, and we haven't seen any difference whatsoever 
between uh, these two vendors. I don't have any other experience with other vendors. I can tell you that we have worked with uh, several sites with GE as well, and I think also with Toshiba, and I don't recall any uh, major deviations based on the vendor. I'm not aware of that. Can I ask you, uh, oh, sorry, can no, I ask you a brief comment about the frame by second for the acquisition, if you have to change your practice, your routine, or if there is no difference? And to extend that just a little bit, we say that this is practical and can be applied. Could you simply go through what are the imaging requirements and how that may be different than what people are doing in order to obtain the correct images? And when we say this is real time, how long does it take for you to get the final analysis approximately? So again, it's a regular image acquisition. I don't know if you're using 25 or 15 uh, frame per uh, second. Uh, uh, but, but there are specifications. Uh, you need to zoom out to capture the full coronary tree, whether you work with on, on the left or the right uh, system. Uh, you need to, uh, um, to freeze the table, so no panning during the uh, image acquisition. You need to capture the full tree. You need to delineate the lesion. It's very important because it's based on angular reconstruction. So if you, you, you have a foreshortening uh, overlap so that you cannot see the lesion, it's going to uh, impact your ability to assess the physiology. So you need to delineate the lesion. So three angiograms, good angiograms, zoom out, no panning, and it should take uh, on, on a, a, a simple acquisition in a matter of one to two minutes. In a more complex acquisition, it could take around three minutes plus minus a minute, not more than that. And maybe for the audience and also maybe for the discussants, you went through the alphabet soup of all the different indices that we look at. And within the these, these, these spectrum of angiography-based FFR or physiology, there are some different systems. Is there anything that is specific to the um, FFR angio system in terms of the way FFR is calculated that we should be aware of? I think the, the, the way uh, the algorithm uh, has been uh, developed and designed is very unique. It's not a CFD. Uh, it's based on what we define as a LAMP model, which is derived from uh, the field of electronics. And each lesion is perceived and factored as a resistor to flow. And we also, uh, it's patient specific in terms of the hemodynamics, so the inlet boundaries, which is the blood pressure uh, at, uh, of the patient is, is taken into account. And also it factors the myocardial resistance. So it's a very unique, uh, a, a very unique uh, elements that are all taking, uh, taken into account in order to obtain the highest position, pre precision as was uh, shown in our studies. So is it fair to say, Rand, that it is not CFD, computational flow dynamics? It's, it's something that different? It's absolutely not a okay. CFD. That's it's important for the audience because we are now so technology. used to CFD that we all believe that we are getting expert in CFD. And then another difference that I would like to highlight is that this technique is probably the only one which takes into account distal side branches. Not only side branches, but distal side branches. So that when you reconstruct the tree, it looks like a coronary tree, a coronary tree. In some other systems, you sometimes yeah, think that you are looking at a small intestine or something <laughs> there without any side branches. Here, it's a coronary tree, and that's extremely important. Uh, for the precision. So the length and the fact that the, there are side branches increases the precision. Uh, the quality of the angiography is very important. Yeah. Uh, so having said so, is there any difference between manual injection and mechanical injection with the, the assist? No, you can do it with both as long as you get a good opacification of the coronary vessel. I think we have to go to the next speaker. No introduction needed for AJ Courtney. 
Hey, Jay. The floor well, thanks is so much. I, I wanted to move up here because we've yeah. had other sessions where the yeah. PCR staff yeah. yells at us to finish. So I wanted to show you some cases uh, in real world practice. Before I do that, though, just maybe a show of hands from the audience. How many of you use physiology once a week in your cath lab, you personally? How many of you use it once a day? Okay, so some, but a lot big drop off. And what's interesting to me is with all the talk of discordance and systems, the fact is that physiology is still grossly underutilized. And so the question is, can we make this better? This is just an example of what happens in everyday clinical practice. This was a patient who was referred, had prior stents, atypical chest pain, good stress test, but because he was a neurologist and was concerned, was actually referred for coronary angiography. Here's what you see on a typical coronary angiogram that was done. There's diffuse disease. Um, it's sort of moderate. There's nothing really critical anywhere to my eye, at least. Um, but certainly, there's disease there. There's perhaps some left main disease, some right coronary artery disease. There's this crazy ventricular gram picture that you see here. But what was interesting is that after the angiographer completed these images, um, they actually referred the patient, because of this relatively nebulous cath report um, with all these stenoses that are somewhat equivocal, uh, to, to cardiac surgery. And the feeling was this was a patient having chest pain, had diffuse disease, angiographically it looked uncertain, and so the patient was sent to the surgeon and came to us saying, is there something else that can be done? So of course there's something else can be done. This is a physiology session. We do physiology. And traditionally what we do is we do physiology, especially in this case, because he had atypical symptoms and a good exercise tolerance, of all three vessels. FFR was done greater than 0.9 in all three vessels, cabbage deferred, PCI deferred, sense is restored, he's back to clinical practice. But remember, this took three guides, uh, two guides, three vessels, uh, multiple rounds of adenosine to solve this problem. And what I would argue is that physiology makes a ton of sense. There's a lot of data behind it but it's grossly underutilized in clinical practice because it's a challenge to do. And so I've actually taken some license, and this is a, from a colleague of mine. He, he has a great CTO talk where he repeats the same thing over and over again, and I'll show you his face in a second. But the reason it's underutilized is because many people feel they know better if the lesion should be treated or not. They feel they're experienced catheterizers and angiographers. In other words, they know better whether the lesion should be treated or not. The data were clearly flawed. In other words, I know better whether this should be treated or not. Even if I do it, I don't believe the number because I know better if it should be treated. I just want to really treat the lesion because I know better. And frankly, it's just too painful to do physiology. And what I would say is uh, my friend, D Dimitri Karpaliotis, has the best face to illustrate this principle, and this is his face. Seriously? Really? OK. So let's see how FFR angio could change our workflow. So first, this is a patient that was referred to me. She had um, prior stents in the right. They had been known to be occluded. Also had something in the circ and had um, some disease showing a very severe circumflex lesion. She had persistent symptoms despite optimal medical therapy, and she was referred for a second opinion. And so this is what her angiogram looks like. Everybody can appreciate the tight circ lesion. The right was known to be occluded. It was occluded. She had no symptoms, and then she had new symptoms when this new circ lesion was diagnosed. This is what the LED looks like. And she's diabetic, so there's an inter intermediate lesion in the LAD. And so the question is, what do you do with this patient? Should you just treat the circ? Should we guess? Should we sort of equivocate about the LAD? Should we send her for surgery? Money, uh, money options. And I don't know, maybe, Marty, if you want to stop, we can ask the panel, or I can continue based on time. Tell, either way is fine. I would go on okay, at keep this going. stage. So many things to do. I think the right thing to do is to figure out what's going on with the LAD. You have a diabetic individual. She potentially could have a cabbage indication, and let's figure it out. And so what we did is we did FFR angio. And this was actually the case that we did within the FAST FFR study that convinced me that this technology could actually be useful. So I'll fast forward to more current day cases. But essentially what you see is here, see the whole tree drawn out. This is a circumflex. It's red because it's significant. We knew that already angiographically. But the LAD, as you go down to the apex, has an FFR of 0.82. And you can really isolate at various points in the, in the LAD where the flow drop offs are. And so because it was in the trial, we did wire-based physiology as well. And these are the actual numbers. I didn't make them up. Cathworks didn't pay me to put these numbers on the slide. These are actual numbers from the trial. And the IFR was 0.91, the FFR was 0.82, the FFR angio was 0.82. And I was kind of impressed with this. We ended up treating the circumflex, which was significant before. She's done very well. Her symptoms are resolved. She hasn't needed bypass surgery. She certainly doesn't need the right coronary fix. So this is kind of a workflow that we used, and that's what convinced me. 
They've actually iterated the system quite a bit since then. I love the numbers in the study, but frankly, I told the company that I wasn't really going to use this because it was a pain to work the system. So they then completely renovated that whole thing in a short period of time, and it keeps being fixed, frankly. Any issues that there are or determined or otherwise, I actually call Alex, who's the head of R&D there, and they are actually able to adjust AI algorithms in real time almost, it seems, to be able to adjust for some of the things that we observe in the lab. And so we use it routinely. And this is a case that I just did not long ago. An 87-year-old woman had multiple risk factors, a negative spec six months ago, but continuing symptoms. And so it was referred back to the cath lab because we believe the patient, not the spec stress test. And this is what she had, and this is an example of the angiography that um, you need to do good cath works uh, FFR angio. Basically, it's a zoomed out angiogram. You can do this. We do this routinely in our lab for CTOs, but the idea is to show the whole coronary tree at the same time. And I think we can appreciate there's an intermediate stenosis in the mid-LAD. But what's also unclear is, is the diagonal involved? Is there, there is some disease here, so how much of this should we treat? Should we treat from the prox to the mid? Should we just treat that focal area? What do we do with the diagonal, et cetera? And then these are other images. We talked a little about suboptimal angiography. This on the right is a suboptimal angiogram. You can use it, but because the, the catheter falls out, it's going to be harder to get an accurate assessment. And I would say the biggest limitation of this technology is you have to take good angiography to be able to analyze it well. So we actually did cath works on this. And number one, the LED was, had an FFR angio of 0.77. But number two, what was really, really helpful was you could tell where the drop-off was, and it was clearly beyond the diagonal. If you had done an imaging-guided approach to this and imaged the whole thing, and I'm going to show you what the OCT looks like in a second, you might not know where to start and might not know where to stop. The additional thing that we can see is there's a 3D QCA that's shown here, and you can clearly see the drop in uh, lumen diameter is focally at that point where the step-up was. So going back one, this is where the step-up is. Going forward, this is where the lesion is. So QCA and FFR uh, together at the same time. This is the OCT. I'm not going to show you the whole thing. Just look at the longitudinal view in the bottom. It's not really clear where the landing zones would be. I mean, there could be a landing zone here. This is near where the diagonal is. Maybe we should come all the way here. So imaging is very useful. And we use imaging, as you know, in 90 plus percent of our cases in our cath lab. But it's really the integration of various approaches multimodal approaches, the angiogram, the clinical story, the imaging, and the physiology that helps us treat this patient in the best way. There's also a tool you can use within the cathwork system to actually measure what your stent length would be if you covered that section with the drop in the lumen diameter. It showed about a 20 millimeter lesion. We measured it by OCT. This was the stent being put in. Again, I'm not going to show you the OCT run, but I believe strongly that you need to optimize your stent results. There's clear data with imaging in this regard. These are complementary technologies. We got great expansion, and her symptoms have resolved, and she's doing much better. This is, this is the final angiogram. And again, we were able to leave the diagonal and the bifurcation alone. Do you stop for comment or keep going? Well, I would stop for comment. Yeah, perfect. Also, Go ahead. To, to leave people uh, putting questions, these are very, very, very nice cases. Simply because they are simple. Simple, simple, simple. This is routine clinical practice. You stand one critical lesion and then you have, yeah, the LAD. That's a problem. It's critically important for the patient to know it and you have it on the spot. Questions in the room? Yes, you have. So, Ajay, you've been a big user of, of physiology for your whole career and have been at the forefront of many of the new, new techniques. So my question really relates to the workflow and how this has influenced your workflow. I mean, has it, has it really become so real-time that it's now it can be routine and done for every case? For me, it has been. I think for us, uh, you know, I'm in a lab typically that has the system in place. We have labs that have it, labs that don't. Um, we feel that we should probably have it in every lab. But so when I'm in the room, the only thing the fellows need to know is when you set up the picture is that I want it to be zoomed out one and no panning. But they kind of already know that because of the complex PCI work we do. Um, and I'll tell you honestly, if I can do good angiography and lay out the lesion, because you have to be able to lay out the lesion with good angiography, I personally don't see a need to start putting up guides and wires when basically we do the angiogram, we can answer the clinical question that we need, um, and then proceed. So for me, it's really actually quite a bit changed my workflow. Sorry, can I ask you to spend some word to describe the importance not only of the value but also the pullback trace? Because in your second case, the pullback trace is wonderful. It can 
very explain how important is this system and how we can improve our practice uh, observing the pullback trace. Yeah, I think that the, you know, this is a lesion specific technology. So you have to definitely, when you do the analysis, identify the lesion of interest you're, you're looking at. Unlike a heart flow, where you sort of get a report of a CT and it analyzes everything, this does give you the tree, but you focus on a specific lesion of interest. So for me, I was focused on the LAD at that specific area, but I wanted to see where the drop off was because of the concerns I had regarding bifurcation. And if you look at the picture on the left, you can pretty clearly see where the change is, the gradient of effect is. Um, also, the pullback curve shown here in the slide here demonstrates that. There's actually an ability to do this um, with iterations of the software with tandem stenoses as well, if you have multiple drop-offs, and that can allow you to then determine what the areas that are that you need to treat. AJ, very practically, day to day, who is doing these clicking in the cat lab? Are you yeah. doing that, the so, operator, or? You have so, an you know, of fellows? Yeah, so I come from a generation where like I like to run everything myself, especially like a computer and, and yeah. all that. So I definitely know how to do it. Um, we, as you know, at Columbia have an imaging team. Yeah. And so we've trained them to be able to do it. Frequently, mm -hmm. though, in these cases, because, you, you know, as interventionists, we like to move fast. If they're working too slow, I will grab the mouse. Mm. That's how it is. Okay. You, know, I, you, know, you know how it works. So that, I, I often will do it myself uh, What is way. too slow? Uh, you know, too slow Just is... Just to be prepared. Yeah, it's kind of in, the, in the eye of the beholder. And I, I think the, the CathWorks team knows we've had debates about, you know, whether it should be like a, a circle thing that, that takes yeah. time. But in general, yeah. once you've traced everything, the analysis is fast. And it's certainly faster than putting up guides, wires, and all of that that goes along with it. I also think that... Everybody thinks FFR is infallible when you do it with guides and wires, but if you don't zero the, you don't equalize in the aorta, you don't zero appropriately, you don't take the wire introducer out. We've studied this even in clinical studies, the rate of artifact that happens that can clinically affect the care of the patient is not small. So there's, you have to do it the same way every time, and that's why we train in that way. So if you're taking the pictures of the left, can, by the time you've then taken the pictures of the right, you can have the calculations for the left side? Yes, you can. Right. Yeah, 100%. Okay. It's even beyond that. We had STEMI cases that while taking the picture of the left, we already, and working on uh, the carpet lesion, you can right. already know the physiology of your non-carpet lesion. But I want to, to make two quick uh, comments. One. Uh, you saw the arrow there in the LED, so you can really scroll it and you're going to get the, the FFR at, at each uh, point in each uh, side of the vessel. So this is really a, a pullback mode. And second, I would like to mention that tendon lesions were not excluded, not in fast FFR and not in the overall analysis. So there is no problem whatsoever to analyze multiple lesions in the same vessel. So I'll resume. Uh, oh, sorry, Bernard, go ahead. No, no, I, there was a question? No. Yeah. I would like to uh, jump also on the comments about the quality of the angiogram. Actually, in my experience, performing FFR angio is a best lesson in acquiring good angiograms. Mm -hmm. And only this fact of acquiring good angiogram is already an added value for your practice. Yeah. It's so stupid, but it's absolutely agree. the case, I can tell you. <laughs> uh, probably you're experiencing that too. Yeah, 100% agree. And then you realize how sloppy we are very often with these <laughs> angiograms. A second <laughs> comment I would like to make about the, 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 the rock curve and the absence of concordance. We always ascribe the absence of concordance of a float FFR angio. But actually, let's be fair, we are interventional cardiologists. When you look at the quality of the pressure tracings, which are supposed to be the gold standard, mm -hmm. also this so-called gold standard is very often everything but gold. So there are a lot of artifacts, as AJ uh, said. So the absence of concordance is also very often related to a poor, sloppy, <laughs> invasive pressure tracing uh, measurements. And this happens all the time, and this has to be factored in. So there are multiple uh, facets to these uh, concordance, discordance problems. Yeah. 
and a test that's underutilized, so it's not even done in many cases yeah. anyway. Um, the, we did a post-PCI, which you can also do, by the way, and I'll get to that quickly in the next case, um, that assessed the flow afterwards, and this is also done very easily with the system. Uh, this is actually kind of an interesting case um, that of a gentleman who had aortic root enlargement and aortopathy, some mild to moderate aortic insufficiency, was seen by our surgical colleagues. We get a lot of referrals from the surgeons who um, had an angiogram in part of this workup that had a 90% circumflex lesion and LED diagonal disease. Um, he was minimally symptomatic at all. I mean, he really could exercise and do whatever he wanted, but this is what we saw in the angiogram that was done elsewhere, this lesion in the circumflex. So I would argue that in an asymptomatic individual, there's some who would say medical therapy. I would argue you really need to understand the physiology of this before just treating an asymptomatic patient, but maybe you know people think that's crazy. So very simple, we repeated the angiogram and we did angio FFR, 0.73. You can debate whether we should do medical therapy or not. We felt, and we had a long conversation with the patient in advance based upon the way this lesion looked, that we were likely uh, going to go ahead and treat it. So um, we actually did the LED as well because there was disease in the LED and there was uh, some disease in the diagonal. We, we get this information for free why not do it? And clearly the LED looks fine. The FFR angio is 0.97. The diagonal was fine too by tracing. Um, this was the OCT after we ballooned and the luminary is severe. It's a very tight stenosis. We felt there was a big obtuse marginal branch so we ended up treating it. And this was the final angiogram done at the, at the very end. Um, and we actually did FFR angio on it afterwards and it was, it was basically fine. So I, I think that I know we're running short on time. I could show one other case quickly or I can jump to conclusions. I think maybe what we can do is jump to conclusions and take some questions at the end. Yeah. I, I want to go back to this slide. <laughs> it was that good I had to show it twice. <laughs> the point here is physiology is underutilized. And to Bernard's point, even if you consider the wire to be the gold standard, if you're not using the wire, which is actually what happens in clinical practice, then that's a false straw person argument. You really need to see, can we improve our current workflow? And I hopefully have shown you ways that you can do it just using your routine angiogram that you obtain in clinical practice. But we do believe that this is, we can't just talk about this on podiums and say that our data looks great. And similarly, you know, the rate of deferral is very impressive, but we feel that we actually have to study this in a randomized way. And so I'm announcing actually, I think for the first time publicly, the All Rise trial, which is basically going to be a 1924 patient randomized trial that is randomly assigning patients who have angiography done to this strategy versus a wire-based strategy with clinical outcomes um, as the primary endpoint of the study. So the idea here is to really show that by using this strategy versus a wire, that the outcomes are going to be non-inferior. We actually feel they could be potentially superior. And certainly the time utilization, cost, and all of that that goes along with using wire-based strategies should be favoring this type of strategy. So we've been pushing this for a long time. Marty's the study chairman. I think he's believed very, very strongly that we needed to do some sort of clinical outcome study. I think many of us agreed. This is a group of people involved in the study, some of whom are on the FFR side, Bill Fearon, some of whom are on the IFR side, Alan Jeremiah some of whom are on the health economic side, Dave Cohen, Bobby Ye, who does a lot of economic analyses and is very thoughtful as a clinician, knows a lot of data, myself, Amir Khaki, um, and, and Rahul, Rahul um, Sharma from, from, Sin, uh, from uh, Stanford. The bottom line is it's a group of people that have a lot of different interests, but our whole interest that's joined is to advance the field because we know the physiology is useful but we also know it's severely underutilized. So hopefully we'll get some good results from this and happy to take any questions at the end of this. Thank you very much. Uh, are there still some questions? We have two, three minutes left for some burning questions before going to a mini conclusion wrap up. Jan? So, Already? Uh, great, great to see that the All Rise uh, trial has been announced. Um, are there any scenarios, Ajay, Rand, that where this technology is not applicable? 
Yeah, absolutely. And you need to know the limitations of, of every technology. So at present, if you have a CTO with large collaterals, that's something that you know you have to factor into the resistance equation, so you shouldn't be doing it there. There are cases, vein graft cases, post-cabbage cases, dual ostia, because you need to really trace out the whole tree to map the amount of myocardium. Um, but they're, they're simple. And once you know when to use them, it's, it's just like any tool in your toolbox. You know when you should use it, when you shouldn't use it. Um, but for the, I found for the cases where it's useful, it's like those other cases, I'm like, oh man, I wish I could use it because I've been using it so frequently and so easily with the other cases. The final point I'll make is I don't think you should use it in every case. So physiology is not necessary if you have somebody with typical anginal symptoms, a positive anterior defect, and a 70% stenosis in their proximal LED. I wouldn't do wire-based physiology in that case because if it happens to be negative, you're not treating the patient. We're treating the patient, not the lesion, but this is a way to add to the information that we have at hand. Is it really important to remember to not apply this technology as all physiology technology invested with a culprit lesion of acute uh, MI? This is very important. So, for example, when you manage no STEMI disease with multivessel disease, remember it's really important to discriminate the vessel with the potential culprit lesion. I think one of the points is that we're in a very active learning phase. There's much that we're going to um, uh, understand as we go forward. Um, uh, microvascular disease, stent planning, all kinds of things that we really have been thinking about but certainly don't have all the information yet. Um, but it's just critically important to recognize that the addition of information of this quality allows the operator to be in control of a more scientific decision-making process uh, which doesn't apply to every lesion, every case, but applies generally enough where it does enhance your ability to perform a PCI. And lastly, I always struggle with when is a result good enough? And the idea of looking at the post-PCI um, physiology is going to be a very, very interesting process. We'll have that data from the ORISE study. There are many uh, parameters that we look at now, but we're not quite sure if they're validated, what the cutoff values are. So I think we'll also get the additional information about not just when to do a PCI, but when to stop and when you've done enough. Are there any more questions? If not, we have to close uh, the session because there is a, another session behind. And it will be very brief because they, they forgot to load our slides. So I will stick to only one comment. And I would like to come back, AJ, to your colleague, your friend, doing like this. But actually, you, you did not understand very well what he was uh, meaning. Actually, he was not saying, I know it better. I know it better. No, he was saying, why not to do FFR Angel? <laughs> <laughs> so, have a nice afternoon.